So hi everyone and welcome to the 2023 Stellar Society Lecture, part of the North Carolina Science Festival. And so the festival has been going on all month. It's uh, April is about over, and I hope that you have been able to to attend more of the NC SciFest activities than just this one. And if you haven't, please check out their website, um, ncsciFest.org. Is that right, Amy? Did I get that right? Um, and uh, just see what kinds of offerings have, have been going on around the state. You'll, it, it'll put you in touch with um, some of the venues and some of the groups that do this kind of stuff all year long. You should get out and do more science. And we like to play our role in this by having Friday night observing sessions. And it looks like tonight's isn't going to happen because if you just walked in the building, you know it's pouring down rain. And we've had a lot of those uh, rainy and cloudy Friday nights so far this season. Hopefully we break that pattern. Um, we, uh, after the talk, we plan to have a Q&A session. So if, if uh, you plan to leave, try not disrupt, to disrupt the um, proceedings. Um, we, uh, usually we have a good group that asks lots of questions. So the Q&A usually lasts a little while. Um, and I, I should mention if it is ab absolutely still cloudy tonight and we can't do any observing, um, come back on another Friday because we're, we're here every um, Friday night that is clear throughout the year. Um, and we've been doing this for nearly a quarter of a century now. Uh, it's hard to believe that. Um, but Klein Observatory here at Guilford Tech, it was the vision of Aaron Martin. And I see Aaron's son, Tim, is here. Tim helped build our facility. Um, and then uh, Don and Joe Klein helped um, make it actually happen. And I wonder if Don's up at Southern Star this weekend. Probably he is. Um, but because of the Martins and the Kleins, we have a wonderful facility that has from the outset always been open to anyone who wants to come out with no charge and no reservations, just come out and look through our telescopes. And uh, we have a wonderful group of volunteers, some of whom are, are here um, in our audience who um, just love to show you things through the telescope. So if you haven't been out on a Friday, um, please come out. We start this time of year, we start around dark. So uh, that's going to be changing. So make sure you pay attention. Um, and then throughout the year, we also have a number of speakers. The Stellar Society lecture has been going on since 2010. And um, this year we have kind of a special one because we've got some upcoming solar eclipses and we and we thought we would try to have an eclipse theme here. And uh, um, there's a wonderful person here living in North Carolina who is into the history of solar eclipses as I am. And so I thought I'm definitely going to invite Barbara Becker to come and give this talk. She's given some wonderful talks for us at our TriStar event in March. And we also staged a very special event some years ago where we commemorated the 150th anniversary of one of those landmark observations in the history of astronomy. We did it right here on this campus. So that was a lot of fun. She's a great friend to our program, and we're happy to have her tonight to give this talk. She received her PhD in history of science from Johns Hopkins University. And until her retirement a few years ago, she taught history of science at the University of California, Irvine. And she's been here in Chapel Hill for um, ever since her retirement. She's the author of an award-winning scholarly biography of the English amateur astronomer William Huggins. It's called Unraveling Starlight, William and Margaret Huggins and the Rise of the New Astronomy. Um, it's a wonderful book. Check it out if you get a chance. She's also the editor of a two-volume um, collection of the selected correspondence of Huggins, and those are those books are about this thick. So uh, amazing work that she's done in um, bringing into print the whole history of, of a really amazing um, amateur astronomer who, who made real contributions to science in the um, 19th century, and you'll hear from him tonight. So let me turn things over to um, Barbara. She's uh, she's as enthusiastic about about this era of solar eclipse expeditions as I am, and, and it's going to be a fun talk, lots of adventurous stories. So. Thank you. And let's, before, you, before you start, <laughs> the, um, so 
this event's put on by the North Carolina Science Festival, Gilbert Tech's Foundation, and the Stellar Society, which is our um, Freedom Astronomy Club. Some of the members are there on the front row. And Oh, wow. We're, we're trying to now an official I, I member of our, of our club. Well, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And I am, I am really glad to see so many people coming out to listen to stories about the long distant past. Um, it's one of my favorite things to talk about, so <laughs> it's nice to share it with people. Um, periodically, the celestial machinery lines up just right, and the moon's shadow sweeps across the Earth's surface and momentarily blocks the solar disk from the view of everyone and everything in its path. Now, for much of human history, the sudden plunge into midday twilight took people by complete surprise. Today, the, the thrill is still there, but this element of surprise is gone. And this is relatively recent development has its roots in the 18th century, when astronomers armed with new physical laws and mathematical tools began predicting and plotting the paths of up upcoming eclipses to let observers know in advance exactly when and where to go. New instruments made it possible to view, record, and preserve brief but tantalizing glimpses of phenomena normally lost in solar glare that promised to unravel the sun's physical and chemical secrets. By the 19th century, Improvements in transportation and communication enabled anyone to witness firsthand as many of these events as their stamina, sense of adventure, and pocketbooks would permit. The era of eclipse chasing had begun, and people like you and me, who couldn't wait for an eclipse to come to their hometown, started traveling the world to observe them. But such ventures were, and still remain, a risky business. Now tonight, I'd like to share with you some firsthand accounts from the intrepid folks who met these challenges and helped lay the foundation of our modern understanding of Earth's closest star, the sun. Their stories are filled with drama, despair, delight, and discovery. And they begin with Francis Bailey. He was an English gentleman scientist who in September of 1820 was feeling very disappointed after watching an 80% partial eclipse from London, comparable, I should point out, to what stay-at-home North Carolinians can expect to see next April the 8th. Bailey's close but no cigar experience left him wishing that he had just gone to Holland and he could have stood within the path of the eclipse and seen totality. And so in 1836, when he heard that an annular eclipse would pass just north of the English border on May 15th, he planned his own one-man expedition to Inchbonny, Scotland to see it. It turned out to be a memorable experience, both for him and for the history of astronomy. Just before maximum eclipse, Bailey noticed a row of lucid points like a string of beads shining through the nooks and crannies of the moon's trailing limb. These beads stretched like taffy into strands of liquid sunshine separated by parallel black lines and then melted into a solid ring of light around the moon. Bailey confessed to being so riveted to the scene that I could not take my eye away from the telescope. So six years later, when a total eclipse crossed Europe on July 8th, 1842, he went to Pavia, Italy, hoping for his first view of totality. He was struck by what he called a corona or bright glory surrounding the moon and three large protuberances resembling alpine mountains colored by the setting sun. Now, Bailey's vivid published account 
with its stunning color illustration. This appeared in 1842 in a journal. They didn't make colored pictures <laughs> back then, uh, with ease anyway, but they took care to make one for this. Uh, it was a rarity in those days. It inspired new questions. Were those rose-colored mountains illusions caused by eye fatigue or an overactive imagination? Were they simply an atmospheric effect or were they true solar phenomena? Astronomers hoped to answer these questions during an eclipse that crossed Northern Europe on July 28, 1851. Scotland's astronomer royal, Charles Piazzi Smith, hitched a ride aboard a government ship to the eclipse's center line in Bulina, Norway. This is from Google Maps, by the way, Google Street View. This is why you can tell where he was <laughs> today. Um, he used his artistic talent to capture what photography could not yet do. So Piazzi Smith painted this. This is his team setting up in advance of the eclipse. Smith likened totality to a potent siren song, which no human mind can withstand. Its effects so overpowering that within, without any preparation or practice, observers could easily forget their appointed tasks. And he steeled himself for the emotional frenzy of the dazzling event. But clouds closed in after the eclipse began, and instead of frenzy during totality, Smith wrote, darkness was everywhere in heaven and on earth, except along the northeastern horizon where some distant snow-covered mountains beyond the moon's shadow reflected the light of the sun. And he made a good, good representation of that. He returned home convinced that these events are just too infrequent, too short, and too fraught with risk of bad weather. Knowing that colleagues had started keeping daily records of the dark spots on the solar surface, Smith tried but failed to find some way to do the same for the red flames and the corona. Still, he urged others to just keep trying or else he worried ages may pass before we know much about them. Another adventurous Scotsman, William Swan, led a group to Sweden in 1851 to see that same eclipse, hoping to see the famous red flames. Worried about the risk of clouds, they split up to watch the eclipse from different sites. And afterward, Swan compared everyone's, um, uh, uh, afterward, Swan compared everyone's sketches of one particular prominence. There's their sketches. Were the variations in their drawings a matter of personal skill and observation or artistry? Or were they due to differences in time or point of view? It was hard to tell. Fortunately, the eclipse path also crossed the Prussian city of Königsberg and its renowned observatory where Julius Burkowski captured the first daguerreotype of the inner corona and prominences. Now, the moon's disk in this image, it looks gigantic here, is a third of an inch wide, about the size, the width of your pinky fingernail, okay? Interesting to look at, but useless for any meaningful investigation. Advances in photography soon changed all that. The photoheliograph, for example, designed by English pioneer photographer Warren Delarue, could capture four inch diameter images of the solar disk, large enough for serious sunspot study. So you see the comparison in size of the images and how you could actually see something in the four inch diameter images, but not in the one third inch image. Delarue visited Königsberg and saw Burkowski's famed daguerreotype firsthand. And while he was there, he learned that another eclipse would soon cross Spain on July 18th, 1860. Convinced that his photoheliograph could take better images of totality, he became determined to see it. And so Delarue and his party sailed on a government troop ship to Bilbao, Spain. From there, they set off with nearly two tons of equipment on a 70 mile mountainous trek to the small town of Riva Beosa. At the 
time, photography was a complex process requiring careful coordination at each step. And here we see Delarue rehearsing with his assistants. One marks the time, another operates the shutter, a third transfers the plates, while a fourth waits near the dark room to develop them. Clouds on the morning of the eclipse cleared by mid midday, providing Delarue and his team with a magnificent sky. The team took many photos throughout the eclipse, including two one minute exposures during the three minutes of totality, while Delarue sketched what he saw through a telescope as backup. In mid totality, Delarue allowed himself a 20 second break and nearly fell victim to the spectacular potent, the spectacles potent siren song. And he later wrote, I was so completely enthralled that I had to exercise the utmost self-control to tear myself away from a scene at once so impressive and magnificent. It was with a feeling of regret that I turned aside to resume my duties, and I vowed that if a future opportunity ever presented itself for my observing a total eclipse, I would devote myself to full enjoyment of the spectacle. The team's photos captured the position and form of every prominence. Now, flipping back and forth between the, these colorful illustrations allows us to see that these prominences being actually blocked by the moon as it crosses the sun. And it left no doubt that they are indeed real solar features. But what are they? Why are they red? Are they fixed or do they change? Astronomers would have to wait several years for the next convenient eclipse to look for answers. And while they waited, some were beginning to analyze the light of celestial bodies with a spectroscope, an instrument more commonly found in a chemistry lab. In England, Norman Lockyer and William Huggins imagined that the spectroscope might be used to see those red flames on any clear day. And they were right, but neither had any success before the great Indian eclipse on August 18th, 1868, which promised an extraordinary six minutes and 47 seconds of totality. As photographers got ready to capture better images of the corona and the prominences, spectroscopists prepared to unveil their soul. For if, as many believed, the red flames are made of luminous gas, any bright lines in their spectra should reveal their chemical secrets. One British expedition to India was led by Lieutenant John Herschel, namesake son of the famous astronomer. Based in Bangalore, young Herschel happened to be home in England when eclipse plans were being drawn up. He visited William Huggins's observatory to learn how to use a spectroscope during totality. After returning to India, Herschel looked for a site near the center line with a chance for clear skies during monsoon season. He settled on Jamkandi, located in the rain shadow of India's coastal mountain range, the Western Ghats. From March until the start of the monsoon, Herschel and his team took every opportunity to practice what Huggins had taught him. And in June, they packed up for the 400 mile trek to Jamkandi. With no railway access, it was a month long slog. Although Jamkandi's skies were overcast on eclipse day, breaks in the clouds during totality gave Herschel a thrilling glimpse of one prominence's spectral lines. And they looked bright enough to see without an eclipse. Perhaps he thought special dark glasses would allow them to be studied at leisure. French astronomer Jules Janssen also traveled to India in 1868. He chose to view the eclipse from Guntur, a French settlement on the center line. Before clouds moved in during totality, he was able to see the spectra of two large prominences. He tentatively identified a bright red line with hydrogen and a yellow line with sodium. And like Herschel, Janssen thought they might be visible in broad daylight. With clear skies the next day, he got out his spectroscope, scanned the sun's rim where he had seen the flames the day before, et voila, 
It was, he exclaimed, like viewing a new eclipse that lasted all day. It helped to know where to look. Initially, many, like Jean Seine, linked the bright yellow line to sodium. But careful study convinced Norman Lockyer that this yellow line was different. He dared to claim that it was produced by an entirely new element that became known as helium because it was first detected in the sun. But few of others agreed no terrestrial traces of such an element could be found. Could the sun be made of different stuff? Months later, William Huggins modified his spectroscope so that the full form and structure of the a prominence could be viewed. It was an improvement that gave astronomers at long last a convenient way to study the red flames on any cloudless day. Now, could someone just do the same for the corona? Well, that became the challenge for observers of the solar eclipse on August the 7th, 1869. Its path swept across North America from the newly acquired Alaska Territory to the Carolina coast. Dozens of teams traveled many miles to see it. Observers from Montreal's Quebec Observatory, led by Edward Ashe, set up camp in Jefferson City, Iowa. Ashe described the comforts of prairie life that his team enjoyed as they waited and prepared for the big event. A little after sunset, he wrote, an army of mosquitoes was drawn up in columns on my cheeks and skirmished through my eyebrows. Maddened, I struck myself a fearful blow with both hands in the face, and so I fought myself and the mosquitoes for some time while listening to their chatter. Ah, said one mosquito, if you want a good drink, strike between the corner of the eye and the nose. Oh, no, 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 said another. If you want a draft of good sparkling astronomer, sink your pump in his temple. Now, during totality, Ash watched in astonishment as a tiny prominence shot up and just as rapidly collapsed in a heap before his eyes. Because the team's still photos don't, couldn't show such a rapid change, Ash drew a sketch. But without convincing photographic evidence to support his account, it failed to convince. The moon's shadow then passed all over to, uh, Des Moines, where William Harkness of the, of the Naval Observatory examined the corona's spectrum. He was startled to see a bright green line, like one associated with iron vapor. How could the temperature so far from the sun's surface be high enough to heat iron particles to incandescence. Farther down the eclipse path in Burlington, Iowa, Charles Young of Dartmouth College was also stumped by that green line. Does it really indicate the presence of iron? If the red flames are mostly hydrogen, the lightest known element, how could they support a layer of iron vapor? Now, similar lines had been seen in the aurora spectrum, but back then, the aurora was just as much of a mystery as the corona. Were these two related? Some followed Norman Lockyer's bold example and suggested that that green corona line might signal the existence of another new element and they called it coronium. There was another observing team in Burlington. Mariah Mitchell, Vassar College's astronomy professor had traveled there by train with six of her students nicknamed the hexagon. They were all friends and recent graduates of Vassar's first entering class. As totality approached on eclipse day, Mitchell wrote, that for which we had traveled 1500 miles had really come and now it was quick work to see what could be seen, to make notes and to mark time in less than three minutes. Piazzi Smith has warned us, the effect of total eclipse on the minds of men is so overpowering that if they have never seen it before, they will forget their appointed tasks and look around during the few seconds of totality to witness the scene. But my assistants, a party of young students, would not have turned from the narrow line of observation assigned to them if the earth had quaked beneath them. Was it, she asked, because they were women? Feeling even more puzzled about the corona after the 1869 eclipse, observers were eager to tackle it again. On December 22, 1870, 
when the moon's shadow would graze the Iberian Peninsula, then move on to Algeria and Sicily, offering a scant two minutes of totality. Now, the British government had previously made ships available for such expeditions, and so the astronomer royal, George Airy, put in his request. The initial response was very encouraging, but prospects dimmed in mid-July when France declared war on Prussia. And by August, officials feared that the conflict might spread and that British ships would be needed to, troop, to transport troops. Airy thought it best to just abandon the whole scheme. William Huggins proposed mounting a limited expedition. Norman Lockyer had a different approach. He used the pages of his new weekly journal, Nature, to attack authorities for their lack of support. The American government is more enlightened than our own, he declared, and they are making, an, uh, in, they are making extensive preparations to observe the eclipse. Passing up this opportunity, he cautioned, would bring shame upon the scientific repute of England. In mid-November, the British government finally made a, one ship available to eclipse observers. The decision, while well welcome, left Huggins and his team with little time to prepare before setting sail to Algeria aboard the aptly named ship HMS Urgent. Lockyer had already made his own plans. En route, the Urgent encountered a terrifying gale on the Bay of Biscay. One team member witnessed the storm's fury from the deck, while below, another braced himself to save two valuable chronometers. And trunks, boxes, lamps, and washstands crashed against one another and slid about the cabin from side to side on the floor. Meanwhile, in sunny Spain, Americans Joseph Winlock, Charles Young, and Samuel Langley of the U.S. Coast Survey had set up on the eclipse's center line in Jerez de la Frontera, where artist Paul Naftel painted this scene of the team at work in mid-eclipse. Now there, while observing with his spectroscope just before totality, Charles Young was startled to see numerous bright lines flash as suddenly as a bursting rocket shoots out its stars. The lines seem to be the reverse of the sun's absorption spectrum, hinting at the existence of a very thin and extremely hot layer in the solar atmosphere. It was a tantalizing possibility that, in, that inspired decades of further investigation. Now, if the urgent passengers suffered a tempestuous voyage, Jules Janssen had a far more harrowing adventure. You recall that France and Prussia were at war. In fact, Paris had been under siege since September. To see the eclipse from Algeria as he had planned, Janssen staged a daring escape from Paris in a hot air balloon with help from scientific and diplomatic officials. The balloon carried him 250 miles in just over five hours to a small village near Nantes. From there, Janssen made his way by train and ship to Algeria's port city of Oran. Now, when the urgent finally reached Oran, its weary passengers unloaded their storm-battered ap uh, apparatus. William Huggins paid a visit to Jean Seine's observing site on the outskirts of town. And we can well imagine the two spent time sharing and comparing travel woes and eclipse hopes. Huggins' team set up on a site that was closer to port and telegraph service. And whenever the iffy weather there allowed, they repaired and practiced with their instruments. Around 11 a.m. on eclipse day, a cheer went up as they spotted a small bite out of the solar disk that signaled the start of the eclipse. Unfortunately, it also signaled the start of an invasion of clouds. And by 1215, the sun had vanished and remained covered until long after totality. They telegraphed the bad news to London and then, as one despairing team member put it, but one idea seemed to possess us all, and that was to get on our homeward voyage as quickly as possible. Now, when the moon's shadow reached Sicily, Norman Lockyer and his party were there recovering from their own eventful journey, hinted by this picture. 
for after crossing the continent by land, they had sailed from Naples to Catania, where unfortunately the captain steered too close to coastal rocks and wrecked the ship. All hands and instruments made it safely ashore, however. The observers split up into small groups. Lockyer stayed in Catania, where unfortunately clouds foiled his eclipse plans. A second group climbed Mount Etna to get above the clouds, but instead were pelted with sleet and snow. Only a third team that traveled south to Syracuse had a good view of totality and came away with successful photos. On Sicily's southwest coast, an Italian astronomer, Demetrio di Emila Muller, sketched what he called the beautiful phenomenon of shimmering shadows. Today we call them shadow bands as they rippled across the whitewashed wall of a nearby building just before and after totality. Now, for many, the 1870 cliffs had just proved a very frustrating experience, and some began to doubt that these expeditions were worth the risk and the cost, while others, like Huggins, became even more determined to find ways to view the corona on any clear day. All wondered, if photography and spectroscopy would ever supply more answers than questions. These new tools had seemed so full of potential, but how to unleash it? Another try came on July 29th, 1878, when an eclipse once again crossed North America's rugged west. New York physician Henry Draper attracted a large party of eclipse enthusiasts to the town of Rollins in Wyoming territory which, thanks to the Transcontinental Railway, was now connected to the world by train and telegraph. Norman Lockyer is on the far right in this photo. Next to him is Thomas Edison, who hoped to detect the heat of the corona with his new electrical thermometer, which he called a tessimeter. To the left of Edison are Henry Draper and his wife, Anna, who aimed to photograph totality. On the far left are James Watson and his wife, Annette. Watson's prey was Vulcan, a tiny planet that some suspected circled the sun inside the orbit of Mercury. Now, Draper did get stunning corona photos. Lockyer compared this corona's appearance with others that he had seen and went home convinced that there is a direct relationship between the corona's shape and structure and the periodic ups and downs of sunspot numbers. Watson happily, but erroneously, believed that he had spotted Balkan's ruddy disk. It was something else. Edison had set up his tassimeter in a chicken coop to shelter the sensitive instrument from the, from the elements. And it seemed like a good idea. Unfortunately, the clever inventor failed to anticipate the effect that the eclipse's growing darkness would have on a flock of chickens. Vassar's Mariah Mitchell traveled to Denver with her sister by train from Boston. On the journey, she battled railway management over delays and lost instruments. I would not have wanted to mess with this woman. They picked up two eager students, uh, student observers along the way and were joined by two more on arrival in rain-soaked Denver. But skies cleared on eclipse day, and the women set to work with their recovered instruments. And when totality ended, they watched in delight as the black band of shadow moved away from us 160 miles over the plain. Samuel Langley opted to view the eclipse from nearby Den uh, Pikes Peak near Denver hoping the mountain's 14,000 foot altitude would free him from clouds and haze. But he found that a lengthy stay at that elevation brought on the horrors of mountain sickness, which he likened to something like violent seasickness complicated by the sensations that a mouse may be supposed to experience in an air pump. Like those who had climbed Mount Etna eight years earlier, Langley endured hail, rain, sleet, snow, and fog at the summit. But luckily, the sky did clear on eclipse day. And during totality, the corona appeared to him like a beam of light extending to the distance of nearly six of its diameters on one side and over 12 on the other to the amazing distance of over 10 million miles from its body. 
Now, despite having just observed an eclipse under such rare optimal conditions, Angley regretted, Langley regretted that he had little to add to what was already known about the corona. Super clear skies just aren't enough. As he explained, an astronomer who should devote 30 years exclusively to the subject, never missing an eclipse in whatever quarter of the globe it occurred, would in that time have secured in all only something like three quarters of an hour for observation. He feared that no one would ever learn what the corona really is until some way could be found to study it routinely. That dream came closer to reality during the eclipse of May 17, 1882, when Norman Lockyer, Lockyer and his team braved civil unrest in Egypt to obtain many fine photos of the corona and a surprise sun-grazing comet. Plus a first-time photo of the corona's spectrum that revealed two very bright violet lines. Now, when William Huggins heard that news, he and his wife Margaret began photographing the sun with violet filters and soon believed that they had caught the corona in their photographic trap. To test their method, they took lots of photos around May 6, 1883, when another long eclipse would cross the Pacific and make landfall on a tiny, teeny, tiny coral atoll named Caroline Island. Now, I've blown it up so that you can see it. You wouldn't see it. It is smaller than the red dot that it lies under. Observers from around the world photographed the eclipse under the island's clear skies. And although clouds prevented the London-based Hugginses from photographing the sun on eclipse day, they were pretty sure that images they had captured around that date showed the true corona. Published these images so others could compare and judge. Now, intrigued by the promise of Huggins's method, the Royal Society sent a photographer trained in, in the use of uh, Huggins's method to the Swiss Alps to take daily photos of the solar corona. Results from that effort were encouraging, but inconclusive. Um, it turns out that the summer of 1884 wasn't the best time to conduct such a test, thanks to the lingering atmospheric dust from the explosion of Mount Krakatoa on August 27, 1883. The, the sunsets were still red. The halos were seen around the, the sun uh, for well over a year. Undaunted, the Hugginses continued to photograph the sun from London using new and improved materials and methods. This image, cap captured just a little over 135 years ago on April the 24th, 1888, looked like the true corona. But without a comparison eclipse photo from that same date, there was just no way to be sure. In 1889, observers were treated to two total eclipses. The first, the path of the first on New Year's Day, crossed just north of San Francisco. And Edward Barnard from the new L Lick Observatory took this four and a half second exposure photo from the center line. It was a remarkable technical achievement for the detail and extent of the corona that it displayed. The second eclipse of that year crossed Angola in West Africa on December 22nd. There, David Todd of Amherst College aimed to achieve a different sort of photographic breakthrough. He attached 22 photographic telescopes to one polar axis made to carry them all in unison as it tracked the sun. Shutters, plate holders, and all other moving parts in the pneumatically driven apparatus were actuated by holes in a paper roll like those used in a player piano. Although clouds blocked the eclipse, Todd's apparatus did its job and it took more than 100 pictures of those clouds during the roughly three minutes of totality. While many astronomers despaired of ever finding a way to study the corona on a daily basis, a new generation stepped up to the challenge. Among them, young George Ellery Hale of Chicago. In 1891, he set off with his bride on every newlyweds dream honeymoon 
a tour of the great observatories of Europe. One of their first stops was the London home of William and Margaret Huggins. Hale was an avid solar observer and had designed and built an instrument he called a spectroheliograph to photograph the sun by scanning it one wavelength at a time. The first prominence images that he took with the instrument in 1892 rivaled the best of the eclipse photos. And so in April of 1893, with Huggins's guidance and encouragement, Hale tried to photograph the corona without an eclipse from Chicago. When that failed, he tried again atop Pikes Peak, but the altitude gave him headaches. Dust scratched the mirror's surface. Insects blocked the sun. Hail and snow pelted the camp and smoke from forest fires foiled the effort. A year later, he spent a week on Mount Etna where the volcano's fumes tarnished the mirror. Its smoke veiled the sun and again with the swarms of insects. The eclipse on August 9th, 1896, attracted the attention of, J of George Baden Powell, the younger brother of the founder of scouting. To view it, he sailed with his wife and a team of observers on his private yacht, and you can see it down there in the lower left corner, to a, a small island off the Russian coast. Clear skies enabled them to capture the first photo of the flash spectrum which finally confirmed the reality of the sun's reversing layer, first seen by Charles Young nearly three decades earlier. David Todd and his wife Mabel traveled to Isashi, Japan to see that eclipse. Todd now planned to run his elaborate photographic apparatus on electricity. He replaced the punched paper roll with a rotating copper drum covered with carefully arranged pins. He explained, at a touch of the electric key, plates came into place, were exposed, covered, passed out, and new ones brought into up for exposure, making it possible to take between four and 500 pictures of the corona in two minutes and a half without having to depend on the fluctuations in the nervous systems of a crowd of observers. Mabel described what she saw. Clouds moved in as the moon stole her silent way across the sun, circling seagulls disappeared with strange cries. And then an instantaneous darkness leaped upon the world, unearthly night enveloped all. At the same instant, the corona burst forth in mysterious radiance, but dimly seen through thin clouds, it was nevertheless beautiful beyond description, a celestial flame from some unimaginable heaven. The pale broken circle of coronal light glowed with thrilling peacefulness while nature held her breath. Well, it might have been a prelude to the shriveling and disappearance of the whole world. So the clouds weren't thick enough to, tempt, to uh, completely spoil Maple, Mabel's experience, but once again, they spoiled David's photos. Now, we cannot end our story on such a dreary note. Luckily, we have one more eclipse, the last of the 19th century on May 28, 1900. Its path stretched from the Pacific to North Africa. Andrew Douglas traveled from Flagstaff's Lowell Observatory to Washington, Georgia. He had been recruited by David Todd to participate in a historic experiment. Todd himself planned to view the eclipse in Tripoli, North Africa, over 5,000 miles away. What he wanted to do was to see if observations sent forward by telegraph along the eclipse path would be received in time to be useful. After totality ended in Georgia, Douglas wired his notes to Todd. The message was relayed via New York, Penzance, Gibraltar, and Malta before arriving in Tripoli just 29 minutes later beating the moon's shadow by over two hours. A team from the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory packed several railroad cars with equipment and headed to Wadesboro, North Carolina, where they were joined by notable astronomers from the US, from all over the US and England. Why Wadesboro, you may ask? In May 1900, this small town of 1,500 inhabitants was not only on the center line, 
It boasted both railway and telegraph access. But Waitsboro had an even more important advantage. After three years of monitoring conditions along the eclipse path, the U.S. Weather Bureau found that it had the highest probability for clear and calm weather on eclipse day. And as this historic weather map shows, the site did not disappoint. Photographer Thomas Willie, Thomas Smilly, excuse me, uh, turned the Smithsonian's uh, telescopes into cameras, including a 135 foot horizontal instrument with which he captured this dramatic 15 inch diameter image of the corona. George Hale's party from Yerkes Observatory obtained good photos of the flash spectrum and solar prominences. The British Astronomical Association's team included a professional magician named Neville Maskelyne, not to be confused with the 18th century astronomer Royal. Maskelyne the magician was fascinated by the illusion of motion created by a flickering series of still images. He was also an avid amateur astronomer. He built a machine that he called a kinematograph with which he captured nearly a thousand individual photos near and during the 87 seconds of totality. Maskelyne's film was later shown in London at a meeting of the Royal Society. Members of the thrilled audience were still reminiscing about that event nearly three decades later. But the real lay forgotten in the society's archives until recently when it was unearthed and restored, making it possible to see the 1900 eclipse once again today. Now let's see, I'm not sure how I do this. How do I? Tom, do you know how to? Hmm? Do I touch the screen? Oh, 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 dear. Oh, use this mouse. Ah, there we go. Okay, here we go. You ready? Obviously not ready. Oh, wait. Doesn't want to do it. Oh, the file, yeah. Here we go, here we go, all right. Now the moon, I won't look for prominences. You'll see some prominences down in the lower, like around seven o'clock, eight o'clock. It was made in 1900 and only just recently rediscovered. Unfortunately, it was restored. The one problem that they had was that they had no, they had no in, instrument to show it on. I mean, it's sort of like trying to show a film strip today or use you know, forehead projector. Oh, yeah. What's that? Yes, you can. Yeah, just just Google 1900 eclipse Neville masculine. <laughs> yeah, it's on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Now, before heading across the Atlantic, the moon's shadow swept over Norfolk, Virginia, where President William McKinley had traveled to view it. Both McKinley and his rival, William Jennings Bryan, made use of the eclipse theme in their presidential campaigns that year. Will we see similar campaign buttons in 2024? When the eclipse reached Tripoli in North Africa, the Tods were waiting on the roof of the British consulate. This time, David's automated apparatus successfully secured over 100 photos like this one in under 52 seconds of totality. Now, compare that photo with this drawing by Henry Moore, who observed the same eclipse from Algiers. And while you admire Moore's artistry, I'll close with Mabel Todd's stirring account of this, her first unclouded eclipse. You can compare 
the video, still photo, and the drawing, and the verbal description in your minds, and think which one captures what it must have really been like. When only a stout crescent remained, swallows emerged in flocks, flying, almost, uh, flying about excitedly. Camels dropped upon their knees, and other animals exhibited much uneasiness. Totality came in a silent unfolding, inexpressibly majestic and lovely. The great black ball of the moon hung in the clear sky while around it blossomed the exquisite corona, like some fair flower of celestial light. Two long streamers below with three equally extended rays above, this corona glowed above the dreaming desert while planets emerged and a hush as of eternal waiting pervaded the still air. There was none of the unearthly effect of a new creation which had made the Isashi eclipse so heartbreakingly superb, so thrilling, so breathless. Instead, this was normal, tender, lovely, full of masterful beauty and power, yet with a peace breathing the very spirit of interplanetary space where time is not, where nothing is old yet never young, in the presence of which mere human emotion fades and faints and utterly dies away. I looked for 20 seconds, and for 30 seconds more, I sketched those streamers with prosaic pencil and paper. It was like attempting to catch the solar system in a birdcage. Then a needle shaft of true returning sunlight flashed over the world, and totality was over. Now, as this last eclipse of the 19th century came to an end, the Todd's thoughts turned to plans for their next eclipse. Where will you be on April the 8th, 2024? Thank you. <laughs> Start. <laughs> I have noticed, and I have no explanation for the answer. Um, Mitchell, as a party, always seemed to go where young men. Mm. Any idea of why? No, I don't think they traveled. I, I know of three eclipses where they went to the same. Yeah, yeah, I don't know location but, that young. Men but young was in in that area of the country. Uh, so maybe that was maybe he was one of her contacts about, and he was a solar specialist. But I don't know. I, they didn't travel together, as no. far as I know. They didn't get there under the same aegis or anything like that. Um, and in 1900, mm -hmm. Young was with the British group in Waitsboro. Mm -hmm. So was the party from Vassar. They were really. Yeah. I did not know that. Well, that's great. Um, at the end, when you mentioned Mabel Todd watching the eclipse and writing about it, what was the knowledge back then about like protecting your eyes? Was she wearing like, I mean, did people in the public and other people that were there, like, were they, do they know they could go blind? Like, were they aware of that kind of stuff? I don't, I, you know, that's a good question, but I would think that any, anybody looking at the sun, <laughs> even a fraction of it, would, would have to squint or shield their eyes. Uh, I, I marveled at uh, Bailey's comment that he couldn't take his eye away from the telescope during that annular eclipse because an annular eclipse, the sun is always there. And I wasn't sure. <laughs> I mean, he obviously went on to see other eclipses and to see them pretty well. And he lived to a ripe old age. So, so uh, I, I didn't, don't know that he suffered any ill effects, but uh, surely people could have only withstood a very brief encounter with direct sunlight. Have you done any studies on the Greeks and the Arabs 
during the Alexander the Great invasion? You know, I haven't. They I did haven't. a lot of work on eclipses. Yes, yes. And right. and uh, their knowledge about, you know, they, they actually were pretty reasonably good at predicting eclipses because they had data from the Babylonians. Um, the thing was that even by the 1700s, people couldn't pin the pathway down enough to make it certain, worth traveling a lot of distance. You, you considered yourself lucky if you were sort of close by and maybe could travel a little bit, but travel was so difficult. Um, so knowing exactly the, the thing was the, the where and the when was, was a, an important change. But back in, in the times of the Greeks, they really did know a lot more than uh, like to give them credit for. And they wrote about them. They also knew that the world was round. Yes, yes. Everybody knew this, yeah. except some people today. Uh, here's one back here. Um, while I'm going back there, can you say a little bit more about Mabel oh, Todd? Right. And didn't didn't she write some books about eclipses? Yes. Or were those accounts? Mabel Todd, them? and you can find her books uh, on Google Books. She wrote a lot uh, and described they traveled everywhere. Um, and uh, I mean, and they did sightsee. I mean, it was it wasn't just to go to eclipses and stuff, but they they traveled a great deal. The the, the uh, David Todd and his wife Mabel, um, but Mabel wrote these wonderful illustrated books about uh, solar eclipses, and um, she was uh, she, they lived in Amherst, and some of you may know of another uh, woman who lived in Amherst who has some some fame. Emily Dickinson. Uh, Mabel Todd was the one who actually retrieved and secured and preserved Emily Dickinson's poems and had them published. So, and she's a she's a very poetic writer, I think, herself. Very very interesting person. If, uh, while while we're waiting, I'll, I'll show you. Hmm? Oh, you have a question? Okay. Yes. Um, so I'm not an astronomy student, but I do recall sometime back in 2016 or 2017, I saw a supermoon. And this presentation, coupled with memories of that, uh, led me to the question of, I guess, how does the angle affect whether the moon can obscure or kind of be glorified by the sun? Well, that's a good question. Um, when when we have what we call a supermoon, where the moon is actually close to the Earth and looks larger than it is on average. I mean, it's not, it, it isn't this big. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the moon and the sun are actually quite small on the sky. In our mind's eye, they seem really out of proportion in terms of their size. But, but the moon isn't always the same distance from the Earth. And so sometimes it's a little closer. And when it is, it will appear larger. And when you have an eclipse, when the moon is close to the Earth, it will actually cause the eclipse length to be larger because the shadow of the moon is so big that it covers much more territory and it takes a longer time for that shadow to cross where you're standing. When the moon is far away, farther away, a little farther away than average, its shadow isn't quite big enough to completely cover the sun. So that's why we call them annular eclipses because you can still see a little ring of, of sunlight around the moon's shadow. There's going to be one October the 14th that is going to cross the United States. And uh, it won't be very visible here. There'll be very, very small visibility of the, but we would see, we'll, have a par, we'll have a partial eclipse here, uh, but it just won't be something, you won't even notice it. Uh, if, you do, if you didn't know it was going on, you wouldn't notice it. But if you go to Texas, um, or there, I forget now, it, it's New Mexico. Uh, yeah, it's it's coming down down this way. Yeah, Pacific Northwest down through Texas, and then the the next one, of course, is crossing, in going from Mexico up to uh, Maine and and to Canada. And so um, uh, there there's a place, there's a lucky spot where they cross, <laughs> and you could see both of them within a few months' um, time. But, but yeah, the size of the moon uh, makes a big difference in what you perceive as an eclipse observer. 
it will determine how long the eclipse is and how much, uh, and whether or not it, it even is a total eclipse. I'll, get, I'll give you a, a quick, just a quick thing here. This is the last five years. It's the weather services, uh, of an image of what the weather was like on April the 8th. Okay, so you see how great it is here in North Carolina. The yellow line is the eclipse path on April the 8th, 2024. So where will you see it? Even Texas, even Texas as the night. So we're not in good shape. Uh, North Carolina in April just ain't the place to be if you're hoping for clear skies. Now here is a picture I took off of the weather map on the day, on April the 8th, at about the time of day that the eclipse is going to take place. So this is what it looked like. There were a couple tornadoes over in North Carolina, <laughs> hidden under the clouds, um, but even Texas had cloud cover. So uh, it doesn't show, you know, it's not gonna be on those maps that show rain uh, or, you know, radar. At any rate, in case you're wondering where to go. Some advice. In a balloon, maybe. Hmm? In a balloon, yeah. Get on, get in an airplane and uh, fly, fly above. You're very welcome. We do have a little multimedia extravaganza. Oh planned. yes, right. So. If, if you know, when I talked a lot about spectra and the color of the prominences and so on, and Tom has been kind enough to set up, this is this is a high, this is a tube that is filled with hydrogen gas, and so this is about the color of the prominences that you would see around the edge of this of the sun, because hydrogen is the pr principal contributor to the coloring of the protuberances or prominences or red flames that they call. Um, but if you'd like to see what the spectrum looks like, uh, Tom has brought uh, some uh, little diffraction gratings that you can put up to your eyes and you can, you can look at it and see the hydrogen spectrum. Um, he has some other tubes too, some helium tubes and I don't know what else. Yeah, some, some other uh, elements. If, if you've never seen a chemical's spectrum, this is a great opportunity to do that. So we could do that after talking mm -hmm. for it to come up. Right, right, right. So okay, well, thanks uh, again, Barbara. What well, a you're wonderful you're very welcome. Thank you. I assume it's still cloudy outside. Has anyone checked? Yeah.